What is going on everybody? Aaron Smith here with another great episode of Forward Gettysburg. Thank you all so much for joining. If you haven't already, please remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel. I'm coming to you from behind the Klingel Barn. I'm here at the Wilcox Brigade marker here on Sickles Avenue. And if you guessed that we're talking about Wilcox, well, you're partially right. We're also gonna talk about the brave actions of the first Minnesota. This is probably a story that a lot of you know, but it is, uh, it is so, so central to the Gettysburg story that I would be missing out if I didn't tell it here today. It's a beautiful day, October 10th, Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day, and it is a great day to be out at the Gettysburg battlefield. So let's get into it. We're talking the evening, late afternoon of July 2nd. Sickles salient has collapsed at the Peach Orchard. Humphrey's division is skedaddling back to Cemetery Ridge. They're getting steamrolled by Barksdale's brigade. And we have Wilcox's brigade taking this position on the Emmitsburg Road, driving this way. The third corps of the Army of the Potomac is in retreat. And Pursuing them is going to be Barksdale's Brigade, of course. They're going to end up over at the Trussell Farm. They're going to get checked by the Harper's Ferry Cowards, if you will. Um, that brigade is going to check them there. And we're going to have Wilcox's Brigade. Wilcox's Brigade is going to be coming across the Emmitsburg Road. And they're going to end up in that little stretch of woods over there. That's where Plum Run is running. Of course, we know Plum Run um, running from there to the Valley of Death there in between Hawks Ridge, Devil's Den, and the Round Tops. Either way, Wilcox's Brigade, they're going to um, come up there, and we call that the Trussell Woodlot. Um, and they're going to see, once they come past that Emmitsburg Road, they're going to take some Union guns there, and they're going to see a gap in the Union line. Of course, we know General Dan Sickles, on the afternoon of July 2nd, moved his entire Third Corps forward about three quarters of a mile. <laughs> Well, he is now going to reap what he has sowed. There's going to be a nice sized gap in the Union line right over there. You might be able to make out You might be able to make out the Pennsylvania Memorial right over there. So there's going to be a gap from about the Pennsylvania Memorial um, all the way down maybe about a few hundred yards. And that's right where Cadmus Wilcox's brigade of Alabamians is going to be aiming for. A little bit about Cadmus Wilcox. He graduated in 1846 from West Point. His classmates are going to include greats such as Stonewall Jackson and George McClellan. He's going to go on to fight in Mexico. He will fight at the Battle of Chapultepec. Um, and he is actually going to get promoted due to his bravery at the Battle of Chapultepec. He's going to serve then as an assistant instructor of military tactics at West Point from 1852 to 1857. He's going to retire due to some personal illness. In 1859, Cadmus Wilcox is going to publish a manual about rifles and rifle tactics, and it is considered the go-to manual of the time. So Cadmus Wilcox is an incredibly intelligent man, an incredibly intelligent commander. So, he, during the Civil War, he is going to lead the 9th Alabama as a colonel. He is then going to be promoted up to Brigadier General. He's going to see some action at uh, the Peninsula Campaign. He's going to be in the reserve at Antietam, and he's also going to help defend the Confederates' rear at Chancellorsville at the Battle of Salem Church there. And that's where uh, Sedgwick's 6th Corps is going to come and try to take Bobby Lee from the rear and uh, Cadmus Wilcox is going to be a part of that fight that fights off the Union and clinches that awesome victory at Chancellorsville for Robert E. Lee. So, he is leading a brigade of Alabamians. It's about 1,726 troops and that's going to be the 9th Alabama, the 14th Alabama, the 11th Alabama, the 8th Alabama, and the 10th Alabama. So, we know on the afternoon of July 2nd, Longstreet, whether he intended it or not, his attack is going to come off in echelon. 
course we know an echelon means that one part of the line is going to be attacked and then shortly afterwards another lot part of the line is going to be attacked they do that so that the defenders in this case the union they're going to draw from other points of their line eventually as this attack comes down like dominoes they're going to find a weak point and be able to break through so here we are Dan Sickles, his saline has broken. His saline at the peach orchard has broken down. They are in full retreat from the peach orchard back there to Cemetery Ridge. Wilcox is bearing down with his 1,700 and some odd Alabamians. And they're going to make for that gap. Now the interesting part about this attack, and this part of the attack, is of course when the attack filed off an echelon, there are going to be two brigades deep. You know, we're going to... Um, at the wheat field and at the peach orchard, you know, we're going to have Kershaw and then Barksdale. They're going to be the front lead brigades, and then we're going to have Sems and Walford right behind them. So they're attacking two brigades deep. Once it reaches Wilcox's part of the attack, they're no longer two brigades deep. It's just one brigade in depth during the attack. So they're not going to have another brigade coming up for support. You know, it's going to be Wilcox with his Alabamians, Lang with the Floridians, and so on and so forth down the line. So during this assault, lined up over there behind those trees there, I can make out some of the uh, monuments, some of the cannons over there. McGilvery is going to set up an artillery line. So, as Wilcox makes his attack, they're going to face, according to his report, cannon fire from both of the flanks and the front. However, this cannon fire is not enough to stop this attack from the Alabamians. They are going to continue to press through that cannon fire, determined to hit that gap in the Union line. Now, they're going to reach, they're going to get up to a certain point up toward that artillery line and the 111th New York, they're going to check the 10th Alabama, which is going to be on their right flank. So the 10th Alabama is going to be checked by the 111th New York. Now while they're fighting, that's still going to leave Wilcox with four brigades to continue this assault heading toward that gap. <laughs> just a little bit to the west of the first Minnesota monument one of the coolest monuments out here on the Gettysburg battlefield and right behind me is exactly what General Winfield Scott Hancock would have seen as Cadmus Wilcox's brigade made its way toward this gap directly behind you might have been a little bit of cannon of course we have the 10th Alabama being checked by the 111th New York over here to my right, uh, toward the left on the Union line here, not left left, but you get what I'm saying, um, toward my right, but we still have four regiments of Alabama soldiers making their way forward to this position, trying to fill into this gap, which would have just absolutely crushed this part of the Union line. General Winfield Scott Hancock, all day on July 2nd, has spent his day filling in gaps caused by General Sickles' move up to the Peach Orchard, and he still has to continue doing that all the way down here on Cemetery Ridge. He's going to look around him, and he's only going to find one unit of soldiers. He is going to find the first Minnesota and he is going to find Colonel William Colville in charge of the 1st Minnesota. And what he's going to say, he's going to look at him and say, Advance, Colonel, take those colors. And he's going to point off to the Alabamians with their rebel flags and their battle flags waving in the wind, coming directly to this gap. Colville is later going to write in his memoirs, Every man realized in an instant what that order meant. Death or wounds to us all. 
Now a little bit about the first Minnesota. At the Battle of Gettysburg, the first Minnesota was not a large, large unit. We're talking 262 people. However, they have a long and storied history for the Union Army and the Army of the Potomac. Not only were they the first regiment from Minnesota to uh, volunteer and be mustered into the Army, but they were the first group of volunteers ever for the Union. They started out with a thousand men. They would see action at the Battle of Ball's Bluff, a relatively small engagement um, just north of Leesburg, Virginia. However, the reason I bring up Ball, Ball's Bluff is because later on July 3rd, the 1st Minnesota is going to be posted just a few hundred yards south of the 71st Pennsylvania. Another unit that was at the Battle of Ball's Bluff, but they were at the Battles of Bu Battle of Ball's Bluff under the name the 1st California. I just think that's a cool little uh, Gettysburg fact that maybe a whole not a lot of people realize, but uh, you know, it's something I like to bring up. I brought it up, of course, in my video about the bloody angle, but nonetheless, something that I like to mention. So, none of these men from Minnesota are going to hesitate. They know exactly what this is. This is going to be a suicide charge. So we're talking 262 men from Minnesota charging into a brigade. Now, mind you, of course, we have our uh, levels of the army. We have the, the largest being a corps, division, brigade, regiment. So we have a regiment of 262 men charging into a brigade of about 1,400. Of course, like I said, the 10th Alabama, they're off. Um, they're off fighting with uh, against the 111th New York um, just a little bit further south from here. Nonetheless, they're going to charge forward. And as he makes his way here, uh, Wilcox, he's actually going to capture six Union guns and he's going to charge this position. The men from Minnesota are going to charge. Cadmus Wilcox, actually, in his official report, he's going to describe the landscape. He's going to describe it as a descent for about 400 yards into what I believe he described it as a valley or a gully. Of course, we know that's Plum Run. There's going to be those trees there. We talked about the Trofa Woodlot, of course. Um, there's going to be those trees there. So that is going to be another 200 yards or so, he describes, as an ascent going uphill. Um, this is going to be vicious, vicious fighting. Soda, they're going to their charge forward, their flag is going to be dropped five times. Their color bearer is going to be shot five times. And five times those colors are going to be picked up and charged forward. As, as soon as they hit Wilcox's brigade, they lose any semblance of, of uh, organization. Um, it's going to be described as scattered pockets of men fighting. And this fighting is going to be intense. These Minnesotans, they realize the sacrifice, they realize this is a suicide mission, but they are giving it their all. They are fighting with every, every inch of heart that they have. They're just going to throw themselves into these oncoming rebels. And this fighting is going to be so intense that later on, Cadmus Wilcox, in his official report, now mind you, like I said over there on Sickles Avenue, Cadmus Wilcox is no amateur. He is a professional soldier. He fought in Mexico, taught at West Point, wrote the predominant manual about rifles and rifle technology for the time. Um, so much that Union troops were actually using it so much that they had to uh, replace it with another one that was essentially the same thing, just written by someone that supported the North. Either way, he is not an unintelligent man. He has experience in the field of battle, and he is going to describe the fighting as such in his official report. This stronghold of the enemy was almost won when another line of infantry descended the slope in our front at a double quick. Seeing this contest so unequal, I dispatched my adjutant general to ask that support be sent to my men, but no support came. Now, like I said a few minutes ago, this is one regiment going up against an entire brigade of experienced Alabamian troops. And the men from Minnesota fought so viciously, so ferociously, 
that Wilcox thought in the fog of war and in the heat of battle that it was an unequal contest. That tells you just how hard the men of the 1st Minnesota fought here in this field behind me. Eventually, Wilcox's charge with his four brigades is going to be checked. And seeing that he has no support, like we said earlier, all the other attacks up to this point in the Confederate line was supported by two brigades. Uh, now we're only talking about one brigade deep, a one brigade deep line moving forward. So realizing that his advance was no longer supported, the men of the 1st Minnesota were bearing down on him, attacking him, um, so much that he thought it was an unequal contest. Plus we have cannon going off on either of his flanks. He's going to be forced to fall back. And he's going to fall back to a position somewhere on the Emmitsburg Pike, which is just beyond these woods here. And that's where he's going to bivouac the night of July 3rd. However, however, as valorous and brave as they were, the first Minnesota they are going to suffer terrible, terrible casualties. Of the 262 men that made the charge, 70 will die on this field behind me. Another 145 are going to be wounded, captured, or missing. Of the 262 men that made that brave charge, 215 would not go home or would go home with visible injuries. That is a casualty rate of 82%. 82% they will suffer. That is mind blowing. For that is just an astronomically high casualty rate for the Civil War. Um, for any war, for any military action. So it truly, truly speaks to the bravery of these men knowing that they probably wouldn't come out of this fight alive and they still went forward without hesitation mind you without questioning the orders without any type of, of moaning or grumbling or, or anything like that they selflessly went forward to save the union line general winfield scott hancock needed them to buy him five minutes of time to reinforce the position here their brave and gallant actions would buy Hancock 15 minutes. 215 men would give of themselves for that last full measure of devotion to save the Union here at Gettysburg. Afterwards, Hancock himself would go on to say, No soldiers on any field in this or any other country ever displayed grander heroism. It just truly speaks to them here at the battlefield, here at Gettysburg, that they gave of themselves so freely for their fellow soldier, for the line here, and in a larger sense, for their country. Had they not have been here, Wilcox's attack likely would have been successful. Wilcox's attack likely would have crushed the Union line, but because the first Minnesota was here and gave everything of themselves, they were able to hold off the rebel invaders and prevent this part of the line from failing. It really is eerie to be out here, to realize the sacrifice that happened in this field directly behind me in these woods directly behind me. I am, I am a huge, huge supporter of the idea that the Gettysburg National Military Park is the most hallowed ground in all of America. And you really need to get out here and experience this place. I, I never come here without learning something new and experiencing something different and, and, and feeling like so many actions here were part of such a bigger picture and, and helped to make up that fabric and that patchwork of this great nation of ours. Thank you guys so, so much for joining me here. Of course, as always, I'm Aaron Smith, your host. This is Forward Gettysburg. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Please remember again to like and subscribe. 
and I will catch you on the next one.